God is so good, amen. 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 How about you? I need that praise. Yeah. 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 First night you were here, I felt like the Lord said to, to tell you something I didn't do. I kept wrestling with it. I thought, he don't know me. I don't know him. I don't want to scare him off. <laughs> but I felt like God said to tell you, you found what you're looking for. That's confirmation. James said that exactly. And it's up to you what you do with it. <laughs> See, if, that, if you don't do it, God will do somebody else. Tessa would be here. I understand she's sick. Yes, I was she hoping did. she'd be here tonight. Uh, turn me to Matthew chapter 6. I want to go through a couple of scriptures and we'll get into the meat of what we're going to talk about. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. Oh, everybody there? Yes. Yeah. Very, very familiar scripture. I'm not going to tell you anything you really don't know. I'm just hopefully going to make it a little more simple for you tonight. It says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I really believe this is just me. I believe there are more people sitting in the church houses today with unforgiveness, resentment, right, and bitterness. Yes, and most of the time they don't even realize yes. that they're still holding on to these so things. And they're wondering why their prayers are not being answered. Yes. And this is one of the main reasons right yes, here. Right. Come on. So, we don't forgive. God cannot forgive us. He cannot forgive us. It separates us from Him. It doesn't destroy the relationship. It destroys the fellowship. Okay? All right, now, Luke chapter 6. I see, I just want to set some basis for this, and then we'll go on from there. Verse 37. Luke 6, 37. It says, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. I want to throw this in too. In verse 38 says, Give, it shall be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, run over, shall men give you your wisdom. For with the same measure that you give them all, it shall be measured to you. We use that scripture all the time about money and tithes and offerings. But what he's talking about here, the the uh, forgiveness that I give, I'm going to get the same measure. That's right. If I judge somebody, the same judgment I judge somebody else with, God's going to judge me. Come on. Okay? If I condemn somebody else, God is going to condemn me. Same measure. Okay? Colossians chapter 3. Amen. Boy, you're quick on the trigger tonight. <laughs> Told you, fired up. Oh, he is. He's only got a few days left, but he's going to be a free man. Oh. <laughs> free from work. Free from work, yeah. That's right. Not free from Julie. No, I didn't mean that. Clarify that. Colossians 3, verse 13. 
says, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel, if any man yeah. have a quarrel against yeah. any, even as Christ yeah. forgave you, so also do ye. Yeah. How did Christ forgive you? Completely. And God said, we got to forgive one another. we got to forgive other people. Yeah. Church, when we're, when we're walking in forgiveness, that's one of the moments that we're closer to being like God than any other time in our life. Because in our natural man, the natural uh, desires is not to forgive, is to get even. So that means you're, you're denying self, you're crucifying yourself, your flesh, what your flesh wants, and you're doing what God wants. Okay? Now we're going to get into the meat of what we're going to talk about. And some of y'all remember this. After a young husband and father fatally shot five young girls, the news coming out of the Amish community of West Nichols Mines headlined a single word, forgiveness. Forgiveness. Can you imagine? Shooting five young girls, and yet this community wants to forgive. Forgive. This word caught the attention of the media, but what does forgive mean? What did it mean for people when the Amish community to go to the wife of the killer and say they would forgive her and her family in this unbelievably traumatic incident? Did they mean they forgave the murderer? Does this make any sense? How does righteous indignation fit into the crimes of humanity? How can we have justice and forgiveness at the same time? How can we have accountability for violation of the laws of God along with the application of the mercy of God? Every one of us needs to understand and come to terms with the issue of forgiveness. Because forgiveness is part of God's plan. Okay? When properly understood, it will not contradict God's justice. We need to define forgiveness. First, let's say what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not a compromise of morality. Don't think God would confuse moral clarity and moral responsibility with grace and forgiveness. God's justice ensures that the murderer will not get away with murder and the sex offender will not get away with molestation. Forgiveness is not a violation of justice. God will never compromise his justice. Forgiveness is not merely avoidance of conflict. Now, we are supposed to forgive and leave the justice and the judgment right. to God. That's right. Come on. Okay? We forgive the individual, right. but they will still give account to God right. for what they've done right. if they don't seek forgiveness. Yes, okay? That's right. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. So you forgive somebody. Say, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something. Say somebody came in and they messed up my finances. I have a CPA, whatever. And they mess it up. They do it on purpose, whatever. And they don't tell me. And then I find out, anyways, I forgive them. It's okay that I forgave them, but I don't have to use that CPA no more. Right? Right. I can you, change. You I can still forgive can someone and not put yourself back in the position to be used or abused or hurt again. Okay? Okay. okay. The, the thing is, and we're getting to, when you forgive, you're releasing that person. Okay? And once you release it, that does not mean you have to go back and put yourself in a situation where right. you may get back right. in the same thing. Okay? Right. Now you can still talk to that person. You can still talk to you, still fellowship. Do There's gonna be people in church house, you're gonna forgive that person, yeah. but you're not you're not gonna treat them differently. Right. And if you really truly release them, forgive them when they walk in their church, you're not gonna feel that right. go all over you. Right. But that does not mean you have to go over and be their best buddy anymore. Right. Right. Okay? Pastor, yes, sir. It's another way of looking at forgiveness. Is uh, you know, it's it's not your place to condemn them. The, like they don't have to answer you; they have to answer to God. Right. Exactly. I mean, when you're judging someone, you're putting yourself in God's shoes. And those are some big shoes to fill. Yeah. Amen. Amen. There are a lot of us who do not like conflict. <laughs> <laughs> If you've been around very long, you realize I don't like conflict. If there's something going to be conflicting, I turn it over to Joy. <laughs> She's real good at that. That's why God makes together. See? Yeah. We're good as a team. That's right. 
We don't want to share hard things or harsh words with someone. So we skirt around issues of conflict. Sometimes forbearance is the right thing to do, but simple avoidance of conflict is not the same as forgiveness. You can stay away from someone, not be around them, but that does not mean you have forgiven that person. Okay? Turn me to Matthew chapter 18. Some of you are saying, I don't need to hear this forgiveness stuff. I'm not holding nothing against anybody. Now stop to search your heart. Because every day we have an opportunity to hold unforgiveness towards someone. Well, you would think you forgave somebody, but you really didn't. Exactly. Pastor Joy will understand for the uh, Brother Gary Morrison at the other church over there, and she thought she'd forgiven her father. And he brought it out and found out that she hadn't really forgiven him. And that's what I'm saying. It's deceptive because we push it down sometimes. And we don't think about it until we're around that person. All of a sudden we feel that hot flash take over. <laughs> Matthew 18, verse 23. So therefore is the king of heaven likened to a certain king which would take account of his service. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him who owed him 10,000 talents. For as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him for a gave him death. Think about this. He's fixing to have to sell his family to pay his debt. And you would think after his master said he had compassion, and he forgave him the debt. That would have changed him. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me. Can you imagine? I mean, he just got forgiven a debt he could not pay. Sounds like us, doesn't it? We can't pay the debt that we owe. Jesus Christ owes. And when God forgives us, and we turn around and get somebody by the throat, we don't forgive them. He had his fellow servant fell on his feet and sought him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay thee all. And he would not. They went and cast him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servant saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he called him and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy debt because thou desirest me. Shouldst not thou have also had compassion on thy fellow servant, even though I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one of his brothers his trespasses. So what really is the meaning of forgiveness? For a moment, try to forget everything you've ever heard or assumed about forgiveness. And that's single, you know, a single word, the biblical word, the new covenant word in Greek is a thesis. In English, it means to release. Now, for a moment, don't take it any more complicated than that. Release. Forgive means to choose to take someone whom you've been holding your, in your debt, holding your resentment and bitterness, and release him or her. Forgiveness is not calling something that someone else did that was immoral, destructive, okay. So when you're forgiven, you're not saying it's okay what they did, but you're not going to let them keep you in prison. No more. That's right. And when you actually release them, you're really releasing yourself. That's right. Okay? Forgiveness means, and, and it's also not turning a blind, blind eye toward injustice. Forgiveness simply means you choose to release somebody from personal obligation to you, even though that person will have to face the justice of God. Right. In Matthew 18, Jesus' uh, disciple Peter asked Jesus, How many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered with a parable, with this parable about 10,000 talents. He said, not seven times, but seven times seven. And listen, he's not saying after 490 times, okay, you can quit forgiving. That's not what he's saying. Right. He means as long as someone is willing to repent, you need to be willing to forgive. That's right. That's good. Okay? 
Now, so the king rescinded his forgiveness. And a lot of times, church, how would you like God to tell us the same thing? If you're not going to forgive, then I'm going to take my forgiveness back. Remember, we talked about it last week. That Paul warned the believers in Ephesus not to give place to the devil. Satan is looking for an opportunity to gain a foothold in our life, church. The Bible says he walks around like a roaring lion. We talked about that last week. One of the ways we give place to the devil and welcome demonic torment is through unforgiveness. Our sin against God is a debt we can never pay. God provided for our forgiveness through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Living in a fallen world, we all experience pain of being sinned against to one degree or another. How we respond when this happens will have a major implication on your spiritual life. When we harbor bitterness, anger, and unforgiveness in our hearts, we end up like the man in the parable, in prison and torment. Unforgiveness places in a spiritual prison. And give the devil permission to torment us. Right. It does not hurt the person who sinned against us. It hurts yes. us. Right. Listen, we receive healing and breakthrough when we forgive the people who have sinned against us. Forgiving others is a choice. It's not a feeling. A feeling will come, but you've got to make a choice. It's a decision. I choose to forgive you. Right. One reason I choose to forgive you because I love God. Amen. And God loves me. Amen. And He forgives me. Amen. And He's going to forgive me for all the stuff that I've done. Right. Who am I to cast a stone at somebody else? Right. Okay? Right. If we wait till we feel like forgiving, you probably never will. When we choose to forgive, it's not condoning the behavior of others. It's not making what they did to us okay, but it's releasing the bitterness and resentment that we have in our hearts toward them. When we do this, we're setting ourselves free from spiritual prison. Forgiveness is the key that opens the door to let us out of that spiritual prison. When he says he turned him over to the tormentor, listen, it was a debt he couldn't pay. And he said he's going to leave him there until he paid all that he... How do you want to pay a debt if you're in jail? Come on. That's right. And he said he turned him over through the tormentors. When God turns us over to the tormentors, what do you think he's talking about? Oh, come on, man. He turns us over to Satan, hey, come on. to the demonic forces, and we get into all kinds of spiritual attacks, and we wonder, why is this happening? Where did this come from? Because we're harboring something inside of us that's like a cancer, and you need to get rid of it. Yeah, right. Stop. Sometimes we have unforgiveness when somebody never actually did something wrong to us. We just feel like they did something wrong because they're not doing it your way. Even though they're doing it right, they're not doing it your way. You're still holding that resentment and unforgiveness. So you got to look at it that way too. Okay. If you get upset and frustrated with someone, you're, and you you hold on to that. That's still considered unforgiveness. Right. And the thing that's why it's so important, and we're going to get to it, that's why it's so important. If you've got something against somebody, go to that person. That's right. Listen, and they may not receive what you're doing, but you're being obedient to God, and so God releases you from it because you don't know what he's asked you to do. <laughs> Boy, there's one thing this world needs today is forgiveness. Oh, yeah. Right. You make one mistake. And they don't, they don't forgive you. They don't forget it. They don't let it go. You get nailed on social media and everybody everywhere comes against you. Amen? Amen. Forgiveness. If you believe in forgiveness that God forgives even though he's not obligated to and that he'll have the best kind of life if we hold other people in our lives with a loose grip, then you will see people for what they can be and what they're intended to be rather than as they are. I'm not going to hold Charlene to a higher standard than I hold myself to. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to see her and the potential that God's got in and not what she's done to me. Uh -huh. 
Okay. Forgiveness means looking at people who have wronged you and deciding you'd like to set things right. But ultimately, you're not going to play God. Forgiveness means you view the people who shoot up school rooms and then turn the gun on themselves as people who are going to be standing before the judgment seat of God. They will answer to God. Our job is to forgive. It's God's job to bring forth the judgment and the justice, okay? You can release someone from obligation to you personally, although the fires of resentment may keep burning in you for some time to come. Everybody wants the feeling to go along with the action, and it's not always there. You do it out of obedience. You do it by faith, believing this is what God wants you to do, and you do that. And as you do that, as you continue to walk in that, the more you fall in love with God, the more you enjoy the freedom of not carrying that bitterness and unforgiveness around, the easier it is going to be to continue to walk this thing out. A lot of people don't even know, until they let go, they don't really know what to expect. They, they've held this for so long. And when they let go of it, it's like let go of part of them. But when you let go of it, there's such a freedom there. That heaviness, that weight, that, that condemnation, all that other stuff is lifted off of you. Well, Stephen carried to his grave. And, and I, I honor that because he was humble in forgiveness even to the day that he died. He said, Father, forgive them. As you're talking about, sometimes they don't know what they're doing. And that's what that's why God has us there interceding and praying for them because they don't know. And Stephen said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I believe in my heart. That's the way God wants us to be, even to the day that we die. Even, even forgiving that we would forgive others, even when we feel like they don't know what they're doing. He'll forgive them. Don't be critical of them, condemning of them, but say, Lord, you know what? Maybe they don't know what they're doing. And don't be so quick to say they do know what they're doing. They do. Because they're quick to put that on and be critical. Oh, you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. And you can hear some people say, what happened? But I don't know. And I truly believe they don't know. And sometimes our unforgiveness blinds us. And we're, That's right. We don't see what we really see. That's saying. right. Yes. I was just going to say the Holy Spirit looks like that. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Listen, we would be terribly mistaken if we thought forgiveness was a kind of a soft feeling certain soft hearted people are capable of experiencing. The boldest act of forgiveness the world ever saw was the bloody, beaten, and torn body of Jesus Christ. To forgive is the gutsiest thing you can do in life. Forgiveness is not for the faint hearted. Forgiveness is a mark of a true man or a true woman of God. In Psalm 32, if you want to turn there. Verse 1. Psalm 32, verse 1. Listen, even the word says, blessed are the peacemakers. That means even when you're not wrong, you still need to be the first to, to put action with it to make peace. Amen? Amen. Psalm 13, verse 1 says, Blessed is he, is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed the man whose sin of the Lord does not count against him, and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin, and you did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. You forgave the guilt of my sin. <clears throat> First to be forgiven is to be blessed beyond your wildest dreams. Knowing that your Creator, the gracious Father above, is willing to forgive your mistakes and your offenses. God is not willing to hold our sins against us. One's record is wiped clean. No debt owed the account. Count seven. Don't you notice the progression of this person's heart in this passage? He said, My bones wasted away. My strength was sad. This person's being eaten up on the inside. Guilt will do that to you. Okay? It's a tortured conscience. When we don't forget, church, if you're a Christian 
The Holy Spirit's not going to leave you alone until you address this. So many times we're asking God, Lord, take me here, or Lord, do this with me, or do that with me. And God says, wait a minute, you've got something back here we need to deal with. Because if we don't deal with it now, when we're going forward, everything's going really good, the devil's going to know exactly the right time and the right place, and he's going to pull that string, and you're going to dance to his tune. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're supposed to confess our wrongs, wrongdoings, but to whom? To the person you've wronged. <clears throat> In every instant, the person is God. In Psalm 51, David's heart-rending confession of his adultery with Bathsheba. David says, against you, you only have I sinned. <laughs> of course, he has sinned against people, but the epicenter of the earthquake of our sins is always our detachment from God himself. Yes. So we confess it to God. Okay? We're also supposed to confess our uh, wrongdoings to the people we've wronged. Come on, man. And many, not all circumstances. Now, there are plenty of times that you can't go to that person. You may be holding something against somebody that passed away. You can't go make things right. But you can go to God. That's right. And be obedient. There may be a situation where it's very vital to them. You can't go into that environment to, to make amends. But you can go to God. Yes. Amen. One has to judge the outcome. To say to your sister-in-law, you know, I used to resent you all the time because I thought you were arrogant. But I really learned how to tolerate and forgive your many shortcomings. May not be the most constructive thing to do. <laughs> you got to use wisdom, okay? To confess to someone in your office that you've been attracted to him or her even though he or she is married is a confession that's best made between you and God. That's not something you go confess to somebody else. But there are many times when a heartfelt apology is a right thing to do. And if you know it's right, don't hold back. You would be surprised. So many times that person that we're holding this thing against, if we would be the peacemaker and we'd go and tell them I'm sorry and really mean it from your heart, you'd be shocked and surprised how that might move that person. And someone you used to consider an enemy can become a friend. Okay? Now let's turn the tables. What about when you're the forgiver? When to forbear and when to forgive? The first thing to do when you think you should forgive someone who has wronged you is to make sure it really rises to the level of forgiveness. Colossians 3.13, we're going to go to bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Listen, there's forgiveness and there's forbearance, okay? You think of forbearance as a kind of a low-level forgiveness. For example, if your spouse is chronically late and getting ready to leave the house for an engagement, that doesn't really rise to the level of a serious sin. It may be irritating it, but it doesn't just doesn't say in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not wait until the last minute to put thy makeup on. <laughs> Somebody needs to tell George. <laughs> uh, love her to death, but that's why I dropped my own car. <laughs> Amen. I'll send her the video link. <laughs> now I'm in trouble. You may have to forbear someone who talks too much. Someone in your house who chews with his or her mouth open. Or someone who leaves towels on the floor. Someone who's incapable of replacing the toilet paper roll. You may, just, you may need to smile and tolerate some of their weird opinions. Or if they have no opinions or, or opinion about everything, that's more for parents than it is forgiveness. Okay? Be willing to forgive. First, we need to have to be willing to forgive, willing to strive for grace. Micah 7 18 gives us a statement about why God forgives. Who is God like you? Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. God forgives because He delights in showing mercy. If we're God's kid and we're created in His likeness, we should delight in giving mercy, not delight in holding forgiveness. Amen. 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 Amen.
question. Be honest with yourself. Honest with God. When you release somebody, when you tell him or her that you forgive, do you walk away with steam coming out of your ears? Or do you yourself feel released? Richard? I was thinking on that forbearance. Is forbearance, like, is that, is that something bad? Because, like, I think at our my old church, there was this guy, he just antagonizes people constantly. And uh, you would forgive them, but then, again, he would come up and start antagonizing you for no reason. But, uh, like, what do you do with that situation? It's just... If it's, if it's just antagonizing that situation, well, that's a, it was a very situation where you just have to have patience and ask God to help you with that individual and help ask God to change them. Sometimes we don't. There's people who don't need mean to be rude, but they're just so blunt and so honest that when they say things, it just comes out that way. Okay, and so it takes God to show them. The Bible says, speak the truth in love. Well, I'm speaking the truth. I'm just telling them like it is. Yeah, but there's a way to do it. Okay? Not everybody has that refined way of saying Okay? Some people just, they have no filter. My, my dad was a world worker. Whatever popped in his mind came out of his mouth. You liked it, you liked it. If you didn't like it, you didn't like it. That's just who he was. Okay? If you really forgive it, you will feel the release. Now that time may take, it may take time, but the decision to forgive will set us on the right path. And I said it won't go. That release is not so much for them, it is this for you. You have put yourself in a prison because you've held on to this for so long. <laughs> and you've allowed bitterness and unforgiveness to get inside you, and it's like a cancer and it affects you physically. Okay? And so when you forgive that person, you release them, you're also releasing yourself. You're coming out of that prison, and so the enemy can't use that against you. When he comes back and says, oh, there, Sister Beverly, you know how you feel about her. You say, no, I gave that to God. That's it's right. under the blood. You have no problem. Right. You can't afford it. Shocked and surprised. So many times we're like, God, why? I prayed your word. Why are you not doing this? Because God has dealt with you about something over here. You still have not done what He's asked you. So why would He cause you to go farther or promote you or do something with you when you haven't addressed this? And He knows if you don't address this, this is going to be a spot down the road when you're really moving out and you're doing for God. That's going to be a place for Him to come in and have a place in your life. Listen, one thing I really feel good about in myself, and, and Joy will tell you the same thing. If you do something to me, I'm going to address it, and then I'm going to forgive you, and I'm going to move on. I do not want to hold on to something that's going to separate me from God and get my prayers answered and you can answer your God. No matter who you are or what you've done, it's not worth losing what I have with God. Because you choose to do this. Amen. Now, in Luke 6.35, Jesus sets a high standard for kingdom living. He said, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High because He's kind to the ungrateful and wicked, but merciful just as your Father is merciful. Again, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Now, do you really want to see someone who's really sold out to God? That's someone that can pray for their enemies. Yeah, that's true. 
And I said it before. When he says pray for your enemies, he does not mean God hit them with a lightning rod. That's not what he's talking about. Pray for your enemy. God bless them. That's, a, that's really hard. I pray and say, I don't want to bless them. Man, you know what they said about me? You know what they did to me? And you want me to bless them? God blessing us. At one time, we were his enemy. That's good. Amen? Yes. When you can do that, that's when you have crucified your flesh, and that's when you're being led by the Spirit, and you're more like God than any other time in your life, probably. One thing I found that makes it easier to to pray for your enemies is to uh, you know ask God to change their heart. Exactly. To change their heart so it softens their heart and you know, then they can receive the blessings that way. Because there again, change them from an enemy into a brother or sister in Christ. Amen. Some of us in here, when we were out in the world, we were probably enemies. Yes. We probably didn't like each other. But when God came in our lives, it changed us. Changed. We're able to love people we didn't love before. We're actually people that can be loved. Okay? Sometimes ourselves are our biggest enemy. That's right. You gotta learn to love yourself. And I don't mean like <laughs> I'm talking about love yourself. The way God created you to be. Amen? Amen. Be willing to forgive in the end is not grudging obedience to God who's saying, can't we all just get along? But being merciful really happens only when God's character is impressed on the crookedness and the hardness of our character. When we allow God's character to show forth and not our character. Often letting go of forgiveness happens only after the truth of a problem has been confronted and put squarely on the table. Confronting someone may not come easily for you, but it may be the most merciful thing you can do for someone you care about. Jesus said in Luke 17, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. That's the ideal situation. A mistake, a confrontation, an apology, and finally forgiveness. We should hope for the ideal while realizing sometimes we'll have to let go of someone, even he or she isn't convinced he or she has done anything wrong. There's going to be times you're going to go to somebody and say, I forgive you, and they're going to be like, for what? <laughs> what did I do? Right. Right. Who do you think you are? <laughs> I'm just being you know, When I first got saved, <coughs> this was a hard one. But I so love God. I want to be obedient to God. God told me to go tell my ex-wife I forgave her. Oh. <laughs> She looked at me like I fell off a turnip. And I fought with God. I said, God, you know what she did to me? But God's not worried about what they He's worried about you. You're asking him for the things in your life. You want to be like him, and he's worried about making you like him. That's right. And so he's going to get rid of all. I've said this many times. It's more important to God what he does in us, church, than what he does for us. If he doesn't do what's necessary in us, no matter what he does for us, it's not going to last, it's not going to be profitable, it's not going to be beneficial. God can give me a million dollars, but if my heart's not right, I'm going to spend that million dollars on me. But if God is going to work in my heart, then I'm going to want to put it into the kingdom, I'm going to want to help other people. Amen? Matthew 18. Verse 15. There. Amen. It says, more of thy brother. Let me go. Let's back up verse 15. I'm sorry. More if thy brother shall trespass again to go and tell me his fault between me and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. What we were talking about a while ago. If you've got to get something against, go to them. Do it in private if you can. Okay? But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Now, I've said this many times before. That does not mean go get your gang and your buddies and let's go over and let's 
confront Sister Beverly and tell her how bad a person she is and what we're holding against her. No, it's talking about get you two or three spiritual people that can be objective about it and go to them and out of the mouth of two or three witnesses make that person will say, you know what, really, I was wrong when I did. Okay? Good teaching. Yes, sir. Are you continuing down the scripture there? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll let you continue. Okay. 17. 17, yeah. If he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. If you've done everything you can do, then go to the church. And the church will address it. And if they do not listen to the church, then we're going to treat them like an outcast. Yeah. You remember the individual who was uh, having a sexual relationship with his mother-in-law and God told them to turn him over to Satan, the destruction of the flesh. And after a period of time, then he told him to go back and, and reconnect and bring fellowship so that he wouldn't be lost completely. So, if they won't listen, then you withdraw fellowship from them until they're willing to repent. Mm -hmm. Josh? Yes, yeah, so well, in the New Living Translation, it says treat him as a pagan or corrupt tax collector. But I'm thinking, too, even so, you're still supposed to be praying for those people. Right. So. You withdraw fellowship, but you continue to pray that God does the work in them that he wants to do to get them where they need to be or where they repent. Because if they don't repent, you know, <clears throat> it's showing the highest kind of love. Because if they don't repent... For what they do, they continue to go the way they're going. They're going to go to hell. Well, nobody, you don't want nobody to go to hell. So if you really love them, you're doing them a favor. You're showing love by going to them, showing that they're in error. But it's how you do it. Yes, it is. If I come to Sister Beverly in a haughty attitude, like, hey, I'm the pastor, and when I say goes, and that's just how it is, that's going to build a wall between me and her. If I go to her and say, look, as pastor of the church, I really want this to happen or that to happen. I want it this away. It's all about how you handle it. Okay? Think about it. If you went to God, what you want God to be, what do you want now? <laughs> Just saying. We need, to, really, we need to put ourselves in there and go shoes sometimes, you know? How do we want God to treat us? Richard? Uh, sometimes it's hard to to, uh, to to find figure out how to talk to somebody, but the best thing to do is to uh, give it some time, pray to God. One of the number one thing is pray to God. Ask him how to do this. Get into his word and actually think about it instead of just jumping into it. Right. Give God time to prepare your heart, and he'll also give you the right words, and he'll prepare the other person's heart. So they can receive those words. But a lot of times when we speak spontaneous, we say things we don't really mean at the time. Okay? There are roadblocks to forgiveness. Let's say you're right, you know somewhere right now that you need to forgive. Maybe it's a parent, a friend, or a neighbor. Forgiveness means release, but there are a lot of roadblocks. Bitterness can hold you back from forgiveness. You can, there are people so consumed with bitterness that it manipulates, it controls them, it dominates them. Okay? Bitterness can hold you back from forgiveness. We have to view bitterness as a toxin in our spirits. Talking to God about what went wrong or a confident who can synthesize may help us to get go of that bitterness. Sometimes just sharing with somebody else and hearing somebody else's perspective, someone that cares about you, someone that loves you, and hear what they have to say about it before you go off and confront that individual. Amen? Vindictiveness can be another roadblock. If you say you're willing to forgive, but only after you get revenge, then there isn't much chance you're going to forgive. Yeah. Does that mean I can't see their car every time I <laughs> <laughs> That means every time you get upset, Fred, you can't open a can of whooping slap. You have to pray for them. 
Yeah, wash the car. <laughs> Are there limits to forgiveness? Jesus' disciple Peter asked in Matthew 18, we saw, if there was a maximum number of incidents of forgiveness, maybe seven times, and his famous reply, no, not seven times, but seven times seventy. Let us know there's no three strikes in your out policy. If that were the case, none of us would ever get forgiven by God. Okay? There are limits to forgiveness when the offender does not admit an offense. Let's say you come to the point of wanting to forgive your brother for having been cruel to you when you were growing up. You resent him for years, but now you're an adult. And you've got your own kids, and you just want to let go of the past. You can do that. You can let him go. You can tell him you've been bitter about the past and decide to let the matter go. Now, if your brother recognizes he didn't, if your brother recognizes he did damage, apologize. That's the best scenario. But maybe he won't. One of his responses is, I don't have a clue what you're talking about, and anything I dished up for you years ago, little brother, you probably deserve. Well, that certainly takes the joy out of forgiveness, but it does not prevent you from letting it go. Right. Just because they do not receive does not keep you from being obedient to God. Right. Now listen, God's not doing this because he wants to be this mean God. God's doing it because he doesn't want us to give place to the devil to right. come in to kill, steal, and die. He does it because he loves us. Right? Amen. Another limitation is to forgiveness is when the offense is ongoing. An alcoholic may become remorseful and loathe himself when he gets sober. He may apologize and swear he'll never drink again. But if family members cannot forgive because the same ugly cycle plays itself out week after week, then the limitation of forgiveness is not coming from unforgiving hearts. They're just saying, you're going to have to prove it to me. Yeah. I said, you cried wolf so many times. Nothing's changed. Amen? Amen. Another limitation of forgiveness is, is that you cannot forgive someone for an offense against someone else. A woman who cannot forgive her husband for abusing their children, for instance. It's hard to forgive your husband who's abusing your children when it's ongoing. Yeah. Okay? Uh, Jeremiah 31, 34 says, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. And this is something I want to get to. It's not that God becomes unaware of our history. God does not remember our sins in the sense that he doesn't hold them against us. God wants us to move with him in a completely restored relationship. If you've ever worried that you haven't forgiven because you haven't forgotten, remember that forgetting means the matter moves to the back file of your mind, not that you become amnesiac. I said this a while ago because we talked about it the other night. Well, you really haven't forgiven if you haven't forgotten. There's a part of our mental makeup that we're never going to forget. It's always going to be there. But what happens is your love for God and your love for walking in this freedom from this unforgiveness, bitterness, becomes so much bigger that you move this to the back of your mind and you don't dwell on it, you don't think about it. Okay? If you're still talking about it, you haven't forgiven. Okay? If this person did this to me and they did that, then you're still harboring unforgiveness and bitterness. You have not let it go. You may give lip service to God and say, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I forgive them. But it's not a heartfelt reality. Amen? Amen. Yes. Josh? If we read in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all wickedness. We are, we, because he, if he forgives us this way, we're cleansed under the blood. That's why we're, we're no longer, like he throws the sin into the sea of forgetfulness. That's how we need to be with our fellow brothers and sisters. They are cleansed. And that's where the, the, the part of the, the heart or the soul comes into play to, to cast it as far as the east is from the west. Exactly. It means to release. Sister Beverly, I release my wallet to you. Sister Beverly, I'd like to see you at the service. But I'm still packing. Never mind, don't So you're not going to get very far. 
but I released it. It's not mine no more. It's hers. Right. Do you hear what I'm saying? And if I released it, then I'm not going to have that feeling on the inside all the time. If you really let it go, and you really forgive somebody, you let it go, it's not going to hurt you no more. But so many times, we say, well, I release it to God, but then we go back and we take it back. And it's no longer God's. We no longer release the person. We put ourselves right back in prison again. If anything you can get from this, you hurt yourself more than you hurt the person you're holding the forgiveness, unforgiveness toward. And a lot of times, like she said, well, they don't even know that you're you're bitter and you're mad and you're going around life like this and they're just having a good time and enjoying life and not worried about nothing. Okay? Luke 7, 47. Jesus confronted his host. He said, You didn't show me any respect for me. Her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. That's why it's easier for some people to forgive because they know what God's forgiven them from. I know the mess I was. I know. I mean, I was strung out on drugs and, and drinking and chasing women and all about me. The whole world rotated around me. That's where your mama gets it. <laughs> but it was God that changed my life, church. And if God can forgive me for all that, why can't I forgive you? Especially if it's going to Amen. hurt me and it's going to separate me from God. Come on. Amen. 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 One more thing and I'll close. That's not right, Pastor. And I'll run a little late. Good work. Second Chronicles 7 14. We say this all the time. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Forgiveness is linked to our health, church. Yes, Come on. Health is for the life of the individual, and health is for the life of the church. Yes. If the church doesn't get a hold of this, and unforgiveness gets in there, before long, it's going to destroy that church. It's going to destroy that individual. Medical doctors will tell you, when you've got bitterness and unforgiveness in you, it affects your physical yeah, health. That's right. okay? And we'll close on that, okay? I hope y'all got this. Yeah, man. 